Welcome to the Westside Investors Network. Win your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. And now, AJ and Chris Shepard. We've got an exciting show for you today. Terry Porter will be joining us to talk about his success story as a professional player in the NBA and also as a coach. He will share about his coaching style for both the amateur and professional players, his core values that he brought to the team, and how to achieve greatness in your choosing career. So let's welcome Terry Porter. All right. Today, we have a special guest with us. We have Terry Porter. Terry is a former NBA player, NBA all-star, and former American college basketball coach, most recently at the University of Portland. He's an active member of the Boys and Girls Club of America and recipient of the Walter J. Kennedy Award for Commitment to Community. So, Terry, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, first, thank you guys for having me on. You know, I've been very fortunate in regards to just having a great career in the NBA. I was drafted by the Trailblazers in 1985, spent 10 years with the Trailblazers, And during that stint, obviously, we had some great teams there. Two NBA final appearances in 90 against the Pistons and 92 against the Bulls. And then went on to play in Minnesota for three years and then Miami for one year. Then finished my years up in San Antonio. So I was fortunate and blessed to be with a lot of great coaches, be a part of a lot of great teams and learned a lot from those guys. And then went on from that and went on and got into coaching at the professional level coached another nine years as an assistant coach and two stints as a head coach in Milwaukee and in Phoenix, and then had the opportunity to play coach at the University of Portland. And obviously having a chance to stay close to home in Portland, but also have a, a great opportunity to coach both of my boys who played basketball. It was pretty special in regards to just having those four years with those guys. And it was a great experience. That's pretty incredible to be able to coach both your boys at the college level. That is really, really cool. One of the other things that I didn't know about you is that in 2006, you guys had a group that was looking at buying the Portland Trailblazers from Paul Allen. That is quite a business endeavor. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty amazing. Well, I think that goes to, we had a lot of great business leaders and they were trying, once Paul had talked about putting the team up for sale, obviously all these great business leaders in the community wanted to put together a strong buyers group. And obviously they had capital and we had to get one outside of the state, kind of another contributor to that. But they want to also have someone on their on their team that had obviously played the game and, and knew a lot about the professional ranks and knew a lot about Portland. And I knew just in my time here, had had a relationship with a couple of those business leaders and they they proposed to me in regards to would I be interested in being a part of their team. And I thought it was great. I think at the time, I think a lot of people, a lot of Oregonians and a lot of Trailblazer fans were scared that the new ownership would come in and buy the team and then and move the team mm-hmm. to, to a location. And I think that was the fear factor. Obviously, when it was all said and done, it was great to see Paul re- retain the team and continue to support the team and provide a lot of financial support and do a lot of great things, I think, for the city. Yeah. And then a couple of years after that, the Trailblazers retired your number, number 30, which how did that feel? What was that experience like? I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, basketball has been an amazing sport, an amazing endeavor for me in regards to provide unbelievable opportunities for me to go places and meet people and, and provide a lifestyle for me and my family. But to have an organization really recognize your body of work and to be a part of their tradition and have the community embrace me the way I did and embrace really those teams and to have them honor me by having retired my jersey. No one else could ever be aware that jersey is pretty special. And so it was a special night. All my kids were there. My wife was there. And anyone who played any sport at any level, to get your jersey retired, it is a big deal. It's not something that uh, you take lightly. You honor it. 
Again, like I said today, appreciate your body of work, your blood, your sweat, your tears, your energy, and everything you did for that organization, you did for that community while you were wearing that uniform. Yeah. One of the other interesting things that I found, you know, doing a little research is that Uh, (laughs) almost every team but one that you played on made the playoffs. And the the winning record you guys had is pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah. And so again, I was very fortunate to be around a great organization, great organizations and some people in the position of leadership that really was trying to use some of my being a veteran, been around the league and had had been a part of a lot of championship caliber teams. And so it did really help me when it came to me being a free agent and where I wanted to go and, and got a chance to speak to a lot of those execs about what their mission was for the team and got a chance to evaluate the roster. So it was it was good. It was really good. And like you said, it was, it's, it's kind of rare to play as long as I did and only miss the playoffs one year. That's pretty special. But again, that goes to organization and the leadership and the basketball ops and the players on those rosters to you know, put a lot of hard work into trying to achieve a playoff bid. Yeah, Terry, we're just, I'm also super impressed. <laughs> I'm a little star- starstruck. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so, but I, I think that how our listeners are a lot of real estate professionals and okay. those aspiring to be professionals. And okay. I mean, I think you have a ton of experience just working and motivating professionals. So I think we'd kind of like to steer this conversation towards your, towards coaching a little bit, if that's, yeah. if that's all right with you. Yeah. Like, can you tell us like maybe some of your tricks or like what you do with your players to really motivate them. And I mean, you have this experience of becoming like one of the top professionals in the league, like maybe tell us some experiences on, you know, the, the trials and tribulations that, that you went through and and how you have passed those on to players and professionals alike to really hit that top notch level. Yeah. I think there's two different phases, right? I think as a player, there's a different type of leadership. Right. There's more of a peer pressure, everybody being on board, everybody talking about what's important for the group in order to reach the individual accolades that we all want to reach in our profession. And so that is more collectively pressure on everybody doing their job, their job being identified, maybe by the coach or maybe by the players themselves. When you're on a veteran team, a lot of times those guys get together and they each tell each other what their role is going to be, how they're going to bring value to the team, how they're going to contribute to the team and help it towards the goals and the missions that that team want that year. So that's one way in regards to leadership, just having a group really take on that leadership. And then the coaching aspect. Now, coaches kind of set down. I think the most important thing is your culture and what you try to have players when they walk in the gym and for when they step on the floor and just everything about how they're being handled, what little things outside of the basketball court that you can take uh, care of. I think that all the teams that you would say that are championship caliber teams that I was a part of, Miami, San Antonio, obviously the Trailblazers, I think those teams really, they looked at players and understood what the players brought when they was on the court. But then when it came to off the court, they made sure if the players had families that the wife always knew, especially when they came in and joined the team for the first time, where the doctors were, where the schools were. They had people take those type of things off the husband and off the player's plate for he could really focus on his job and his task. So he couldn't have any outside noise, any outside contributors to why he wasn't performing at the level that he should be performing at. And then it comes down to when you talk about coach player relationship or boss or employee, it's about the relationships. It's about the relationships that you build with your players. And it's about you understanding what his goals and what he wants to try to accomplish. And you trying to put him in position to help him achieve some of those success. And yes, there's got to be sacrifices and everything, but still, you got to understand and make he make sure he understands that you, coaching staff and organization, value what he brings to the tape. What he brings to the table. Prime example: that Portland team I was a part of. We were rolling pretty good, and we still we had a piece missing. 
we got Buck Williams in the Sam Bowie trade. And Buck came to our team and just added that final piece that we needed. And so, again, he made a sacrifice right away. When Buck came from New Jersey, he was a 20 points, 10-plus rebound guy. He joined our team and realized that Clyde, myself, and then Jerome were the main offensive weapons. And he really limited his – he didn't look to score that much. He took on some of the other areas that we feel that team needed to be successful. And so I think in regards to just meeting with your players, showing that you care about where they're at in their career, how you can help them build another skill to better prepare them for their career and go out and be successful – and I think one of the most important things, especially in professional sports, is you got to be honest with guys. You got to be honest in regards to how you try to leadership and how you try to coach them through mistakes. You got to be careful and you got to know how each guy's handle difficult and criticism. Some guys, you can yell at them in front of the other guys. Some guys, you can't. And that's a hard thing because these are professional athletes. These guys are, for one of the things that is so difficult when you talk about professional athletes in the model, it's most of the time every player is making more than the coach. It doesn't, it's down to the 12th, the 13th, <laughs> the 14th guy. They're making more money than the coach. So your ability mm-hmm. to motivate that player can be a challenge. It can be a challenge. And what you have to do, like I said, is just have a great relationship with them and be honest with them and let him know that you have his best interest in heart. And know that, you know, decisions you make are going to be overall when it's said and done, it's going to be what's best for the group, not the individual. And I think those are the type of leaderships you have to bring to organization. I don't care how big it is. Everybody's got to understand their roles. Everybody's got to feel like their, their role is valued. Their role is valued for the organization and for the team. And that when it comes time and there is success, then they expect rewards. They expect compensation in regards to just, you know, doing those things. And so that's a lot of different layers there. But I think all those things play an important part when you talk about trying to build the right type of organization and have each employee, each player feel that they're, what they bring to the table is very important to the team and to that company. And then what and how you value their skill sets. Terry, that so much amazing information in that little past couple minutes. I really love hearing you chat about culture and also about giving feedback and possibly criticism. So can I ask, when you were coaching the University of Portland, how did you get to know your players and how did you know how to give them feedback and what was the culture like? Or how did you build up that culture so that you could be able to do that? Yeah, and again, I think you try to be honest with your player from day one. You talk about what you expect of each one of them, what their responsibilities are. And obviously at the college level, it's totally different than the professional level. They have a lot of things on their plate. They have classrooms, they have weights, they have work study, they I mean they have study hall. So they have a lot of different variables that's very important in regards to what their overall success for. And what we talked a lot about is taking care of the small things, doing the things that you are controlled of, showing up on time in classroom every day, making sure that you're engaged in the classroom. And the same for when you're walking around campus, you represent the basketball program. Make sure you carry yourself in a way that we can all be proud of. And then when we travel, you know, we got the University of Portland on our uniforms, on our sweats, and make sure we're conducting our way and ourselves in a way that bring honor to the university. And I think those things are the important things that happen off the court. And then on the court, it's about, you know, what our goals are, how we're going to try to achieve them, how we got to lean on each other and really try to, you know, help each other get through the, the tough times. Yeah, that is awesome. And like every year you have some new mm-hmm. players come in and then new players yeah. go out. Like when those new players come in, like, how do you kind of like determine what type of player they are or like kind of get to know them and then like bring them into the team? Well, that's all part before they really accept the scholarship. There's a lot of due diligence in regards to assistant coaches going out and watching them in practice, watching them play games. And then in the summer, that's a lot of the time when the head coach 
goes out and watch them compete in a game setting, talk to their coaches, talk to their parents at different times of the summer. And then you talk about, as you're speaking to them, you talk about values and things that are important to your program and how they're going to be able to help those things that you feel that's important for our program, what skills they bring that you feel is going to really help them, you know, in regards to our program. And then talk about the academics. You always talk about the academic piece. And you talk about the, to the mom and dads, you talk about, you know, just providing a safe environment for their kids to go. A lot of the kids that we got was from out of state. So, you know, as a parent, you know, you send your kid out of state, far away, you want to make sure he's in a good environment. He have, he has male role models that he look up to that are doing things and teaching him the right way to conduct himself. And, and when he leaves after those four years, he has a degree and he's prepared himself. He knows how to handle himself. He knows how to, to, you know, conduct himself as a young man. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the differences between coaching college and coaching in the NBA and just how that, I mean, taking someone who has, you know, not very much experience to dealing with the like highest class professionals in the world. Yeah. I mean, I think you can just go to the terms, right? Amateur and professional. Yeah. That's a big difference right there. The, obviously the scholar student athlete is still an amateur. He's got a lot of the things that he has to, you know, juggle on a day-to-day basis. And in regards to being a professional basketball player or just being a professional or anything, it is your profession for the most time, for the most part. It's about you bringing in your craft that you currently have and understanding you have to continue to improve in all areas, especially areas where you feel you need that improvement. You know, each kid comes into the NBA ranks and nowadays more so when I came in, these kids are younger and younger. And yes, they may have one great skill, but there may be three or four other skills that they don't have. They have to understand the importance of them becoming around a complete and all around good players. And so as the coaches, you have to have meetings with them. You have to watch film with them. You have to talk to them about the importance of the current skills they have. And then if they want to achieve longevity and, and financial rewards and, indi- and individual accolades, well, their skill level have to continue to grow. You know, it's like every, after every season, Every player has a meeting with a coach, and that coach, based on the coach's conversations that they have, they have a list of things that each player needs to improve on in order to, you know, make that next step. Because if they don't, if they don't, there will be someone coming in that draft or a free agent who will be trying to take their job, and that's it's their job. And so it's, it's up to them to understand that and build the skills during the offseason that they need to continue to impress the coaches, the organization, and then to the point where then their contracts expire and they're able to go out and get a bigger contract and get more financial security, and then get some individual accolades and get those things that are going to, again, propel their careers and make them successful. Yeah, so... With coaching in college, I'm assuming there's a different, you have a different amount of resources than you did when you're in the NBA. How did you juggle, you know, I'm assuming there were vast resources. You had like tons of assistance mm-hmm. and, you know, very robust structure versus coaching in college where I'm, I'm assuming you had maybe less to work with. Well, yeah, well, at the professional levels, you had what they would call endless, <laughs> endless. <laughs> <laughs> there is, you know, really no budget in regards to try to stay close to. But at the collegiate level, every school goes through it. And there's so much that you, you are allowed to have for spending on recruiting and visits. And then you talk about recruiting trips for your coaching staff. And then you talk about it in regards to just the team itself. And so, I think you just have to you have to understand what those what those budgets are and then you have to try your best to you know manage those look at the garden lines see if you know the tricky part for us was you know if we got involved with a kid that lived in New York well most likely we couldn't go four or five times to New York it just the cost was just not going to be worth it so we tried to see if that kid was going to be somewhere closer to our region was he going to be in Las Vegas was it going to be somewhere else where we could maybe, you know, send another coach? 
And then the same in regards to just having the ability to try to really look locally and see if there are some kids locally we could really try to, you know, recruit and keep your costs down as much as you can. That's one of the tricky parts when you have a tight budget is how much of that's going to go towards recruiting because recruiting is is the game when it comes to college sports. You got to be able to bring in players that obviously can perform on the floor, but also can perform in the classroom. And Portland's a, a strong academic school. And so that was, you know, something that you always had to take in consideration when you talked about what kind of kids you're trying to bring in to the university fall and to the uh, University of Portland pilot family. Yeah, I like it. So when you're bringing these recruits in, and you mentioned goal setting earlier that you, you know, the coach has to come up with a, yeah. a list. Is there any techniques that maybe as an NBA player you receive like from coaches or that as a coach that you've, you give to the players? How do you set those goals? And then how do you, do you guys like measure them? I mean, I guess kind of talk to me a little bit more about how those goals are set and, and achieved if they can. Yeah, I think you sit down, again, at the professional level, I was fortunate. I had veterans playing my position that really talked me through the scenarios of what it took to play that position. Darnell Valentine was great when I was a rookie. Talked to me a lot about playing the point guard position. And, and as I was on the bench, he would, you know, he was on the bench, he would pick out certain things that happened on the floor to try to educate me on them. But overall... You got to have, you like to have veterans that really take you under their wing and mentorship, right? I think that happens more at the professional level. There's a lot of times there's some mentorship going on. That even happens at the professional level. I think that's very critical. Player to player. Coach to player, it's pretty simple. I mean, you come in and let's say you come in, like take me, for example. I came in and again, I'm aging myself here. We didn't have a three-point line or a shot clock when I, came, <laughs> when, I, when I came into the NBA. So I had to learn how to shoot the three ball. You know, and I had to learn how to be consistent and be good with that. I had to learn how to play the point guard position more. And I had to learn how to not have the ball in my hands. Clyde was a great guard that really liked to handle the ball a lot as well. So that's where my shoot, my, my ability to improve my shooting, my perimeter shooting, was so critical. And Rick Adelman, I give him a lot of credit for spending a lot of time with me on working on my shot and extending my range. And again, building that skill. I didn't have that skill in order for me to make it in the league and become an effective player. That was a skill I was going to need to be able to fit with the other players on the floor and what their strengths were. And that's something that we would talk about, you know, shooting percentages, from year to year, you know, year over, year ends, okay, you shot 29%. Well, you got to get that up to low 30s or mid 30s next year. Here's the strategy. Here's what you got to do. Take these many shots, you know, a week during the summer and just work on building that type of consistency and that ability to knock down that shot. If it was a defensive situation that you felt that the coaches felt that you were not executing properly, a defensive scheme, a pick and roll coverage, Well, then when a lot of the pick and roll stuff you did in the summer, it was your ability to work on those agility moves, get the physicality you needed to kind of help you improve in those areas. So, Terry, you mentioned you received a lot of mentorship from veteran players. As you became a veteran yourself, how did you find yourself being a mentor? And what was that like for you? It was great. I think Again, you know, for me, it started at the college rank. College is about mentoring. Veterans, senior, junior, upperclassmen always took the freshmen in and talked to them about culture and tradition and told them what they need to do and how they need to conduct themselves. That was very important. Then I just, into the pro ranks, I was fortunate to have veterans to mentor me. And as I got myself in a position like that, I took rookies all the time and just talked to them about the importance of how to deal with money and you know, how to deal with family members, but how to, how to become a pro, you know, how to get a used and accustomed to going out and, and going into the community and, and speaking to kids and speaking to, you know, corporations. It was very important to, you know, provide that type of leadership. You just touched on some like outside distractions, you know, from like the main body of work playing mm-hmm. basketball. How do you manage outside distractions? And how would you mentor younger players to manage that too. Yeah, I think you have to you have to show them what's, you know, obviously 
please, guys, everybody get – they're blessed to get drafted in the league. They have unlimited resources, more resources than probably anybody in their family really had. So they're going to want to go out. They're going to want to hang. They want to maybe buy something really flashy and, and something, you know, harsh. And you have to have the hard conversation about, you know, if this is not going to last forever, you have to be smart about how you go about, you know, getting those big purchases for your mom or your dad or siblings, how you're going to live, what kind of nightlife you're going to have, you know, how some of that based on the guy's background, you got to tell them the importance of, you know, taking care of your body and not being able to go out. Guys going to go out. Anybody in their twenties, they go out. That's part of it. And you should go out. You should enjoy the fruits of your labor and have some excitement, but there's a, there's a fine line or understanding how to go out enjoy those special nights, but also maintain the conditions and your body and the sleep and other things you need in order to perform the next day. Cool. So what do you think were kind of some of the core values you brought to your coaching in terms of like, what were some of the main principles that you would try and bring to an organization? Well, I think, again, based on the coaches I had and the organizations I was part of, being a profession, professionalism was something very important for me. What falls under that? Being on time for any type of appointment, that being something you had to go in the community, you had to go to a doctor's appointment, you had to go to practice. I mean, you have to value the people time. That was something very important we talked about, being professional. You know, being a good teammate, you know, being a good teammate. In your scenario, being a good coworker. What is a good teammate? You know, I mean, making sure if you're on the road, especially if he's a rookie, making sure he's up, you know, making sure he has a place to go to have dinner, make sure you get him out of the room. Those things are very important. Try to have the team get together on road trips and really spend time together. I think those those type of times where you can really spend time and build some camaraderie and some trust with each other goes a long way when you get back on the court together. And those are the type of things we talked about. Talked about always talking about your goals among yourselves, talking about how we're going to be able to achieve those goals. What is it going to take? What kind of work is it going to take? I mean, always having those presence in your conversations for everybody can be on board. Everybody knows what the goals are. Everybody knows the type of commitment that everybody is looking for from each other. And those things I think are are very important. And the coaches, good coach as well. They always talked about, you know, what happens in games and, you know, our short, you know, the next three or four or five games, what those opponents are and what we have to do in order to try to, you know, win a majority of those games. So I think all those things that are critical for each organization, if your organization really values really the communication between your customers and your employees and making sure they have the ability to reach out to those customers on a regular basis for that customer, again, can feel that, you know, they really value their partnership and value them. And that's I mean, basketball at the end of the day. It's about the players and their partnership to each other and their commitment to each other and the sacrifices they make for each other in order for the whole collective group. And that's, that's what it's all about. And anything, any championship team, it doesn't matter. You're going to find those type of characteristics involved with that intertwined in that organization. There's going to be great leadership. There's going to be great mentorship. There's going to be professionalism. There's going to be a commitment to each other. And it's going to be a scenario where voices, whoever the voices are, whoever the leaders are, are going to, you know, at times coach guys or talk to guys in the heat of the battle about their effort, about them not executing, about them not playing up to the level that's expected of them. And all those things are very important when it comes to, you know, achieving greatness. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned like commitment and like, have you experienced a time where maybe one of your players or one of your teammates like wasn't showing the level of commitment that you were expecting or the team was expecting of them? Yeah, that's why guys get traded. (laughs) Guys get traded and guys get let go. There's a certain level of expectations when a when the organization maybe pay a guy a big number, a big contract, and he doesn't perform to the level that they think that that contract is warrant to the point where, you know, on a veteran team, there's been stories on veteran teams when a, a free agent comes in 
and he's just not putting in the work, the post-practice work or putting in the film work, the veterans of those teams, the elite championship caliber teams, they go into the coaches or go into the GM and say, hey, this guy's just not a good fit. He's not doing the things. He's not committed to what we do. Phone is picked up. The guy is getting called into the office and he's being traded. I mean, that's that's the harsh reality in professional sports. You get paid to do a job. You get paid to be a part of a team and you have to be able to emerge yourself into the commitment and what that team is all about. And when someone doesn't do that, they show signs time after time again. They stay out too late. They miss practice. They miss bus time to go somewhere. They don't show up for a charity event. They don't show up for a big sponsor event. Those are the things that you know, organizations look at very harshly because he is not committed to what this organization core values are and what how we try to partnership with the community and the business people in our community. And so that's what happens. I mean, kid, you know, he's been evaluated at the professional level on all those scenarios, you know, and is he, is he a kid that's going to be the first one there and the last one to leave? Or is he the last one to show up and the first one to leave? All those things that probably the general public don't see that happens in regards to how GMs and how coaches evaluate each player at the end of the year to determine if they're going to get a contract, if they're going to get an extension, if they want to bring them back. Is he a good fit? You hear that a lot. Is he a good fit for this group? Is he a good fit for our core values, for this organization and for this team to reach the level that we're trying to reach? And teams that are, you know, obviously on a lower level trying to get to a championship level, they want to make sure they have veterans and make sure to get guys that are professionals and guys that are at the championship level. Those guys have been around the block. They've been a part of championship teams. They know what they have to, how they have to conduct themselves on a day to day basis. They know what they have to do in order to try to put themselves in the best position to achieve their goals. I really love how you tie in the, the on the court and off the court, and it's a whole package. And I'm just so impressed with all the stuff that we've talked about today has been so adjacent to business. It's really amazing. I know that my brother and I go through and we're trying to bring agents up and, and coach them essentially. And, and there's so much here that, that we really try to apply in our business. And it's really fun to hear it from such a great success story as yourself, Terry, and, and what, you've, what you've done and been in the NBA. So really appreciate you coming on, but I think we might be getting on towards our last okay. four questions. Chris, was there, was there any other questions you wanted to ask before we, we get into the last four? Well, I just wanted to touch on one thing that Terry said, you know, like in the NBA, your goal is to achieve greatness. And that you know, in business, sometimes that can get lost. Like sometimes the goal in business is not to achieve greatness. Maybe it's just to get the job done. But I think that that might be something that makes just working a job way more difficult than trying to achieve greatness. And it's such a cool like way to think about, okay, like we're trying to do something great here. And well, I mean, I I would just say that you know, there's a lot of different levels of greatness, right? Each organization has to determine what greatness is. It may not be the number one seller. It may improve your sales from the following year, you know, by 5%, Mm -hmm. 2%. That is reaching greatness. That's improvement. That's working towards the right direction. So in sports, there's only one winner at the end of the year. There's only one winner in sports. (laughs) There's a lot of different victories along the way, though, that you can't just, you know, don't appreciate those victories as well. Yes, you didn't reach the ultimate goal, but there was maybe five or six goals that you guys set at the beginning of the year and you put in the effort and you put in the commitment and you put in the dedication and you still were able to achieve a good portion of those. That's a form of greatness. That's a form of greatness. It's not the ultimate level of greatness, but it's a form of greatness because there's always sacrifices and commitment that has to be achieved in order to have some form of greatness. All right. And I I have to ask... What are your thoughts on the, the Blazers this year? They're, you know, having a, a decent start. Like, it seems like they're struggling a little bit with chemistry. But, I mean, I still love watching them. I'm really, really hoping they get it together. Well, I mean, I think, again, I don't know what the expectations of the team is. I'm not around those guys. I don't know what those guys are expiring to try to do this year. Make the playoffs, get home court advantage. There's a lot of different things they could 
they could expire to be. Obviously, you have a great playoff run. I do think that whenever you get a, a new coach, that it takes time for his system to get acclimated to the guys. Chauncey, I think, is – I coached Chauncey in Detroit. I think he's a – he was a great player. He had all the qualities that you want in a coach. He's been around. He's been with great championship teams. He's been coached by great coaches. He's been, a t- he's been around with some adversity. Mm-hmm. If you look at his career early on, Chauncey got traded a lot. I think he got traded like two or three times within one year. I think he may have gotten traded to Boston – and may not have ever even played in a Boston uniform. He just got traded, and then he got traded again. So, you know, he's faced adversity, right? So he can talk to that to the guys in regards to how each guy has faced some adversity. And then he can talk about his championship runs that he had in Detroit and how those teams would come together. And they had a lot of different parts to those teams. And so it's early. I would say early on so far, they have not reached the level I think that they would like. They've lost to some, some tough games. I mean, you can lose the game. You can lose games. But the Philly game the other day, they lost to Philly without Philly, arguably, the top three or four guys. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, some of those games, they just got to figure out a way to win. They got to have a, a will to win. And, you know, the challenging part for them is their best player, Dame, right now is really struggling. He's not playing at a level that he established. And that what, you know, the fan base is used to seeing him do, but I'm not worried about him. He, he's the guy that's committed to his craft. He puts mm-hmm. in the work. It's just a matter of time. Everybody goes through a bad shooting stretch. I had him. Everybody has him. And it just come at different parts of the season. You know, it's good to have him maybe get this in early and get it out the way. You know, I hope people don't forget about what he did in Denver. That's just <laughs> what he did in Denver. So he, he is committed to his craft, and he is committed to being the best player he can be. Well, thank you for that, Terry. Yep. All right, let's jump into the last four questions. Yep. All right. Good. I will start us off with the first one. Terry, what's one piece of advice you would give to your 25-year-old self? I would say to smell the roses, enjoy it more. I think you get in the moment sometimes and you don't appreciate it. You don't appreciate the success to some degree because you think that success is going to last forever, right? You think, you think you're going to be able to maintain it forever. And so for the younger me, I would say and just sit back and enjoy those more. I wish I would have just took more time to really enjoy just, you know, my ability to come in from an NAI school, Linfield or Lewis and Clark and making it to the league, and then becoming a starter, then becoming an all-star, then making it to the finals. Times just didn't seem like, you know, it's just you, you're on to the next thing, right, before you really appreciate what you just accomplished. And so I would say just enjoy the successes. Enjoy them and try to have friends and family around who help you get there and just show appreciation to them for what you've been able to accomplish. Showing appreciation, that's such a, like, fruitful thing. Very cool. What was your first entrepreneurial endeavor, Terry? My very first one, I did a, a what you would call in the food space. I partnered up with a friend who had an old family recipe that had like a sorbet ice cream. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we partnered up his grandmother's recipe and we tried to kick it, you know, build it out on a national scale. And we started more locally and regionally in Minnesota when I went to Minnesota. And I tasted it, loved it. And he obviously, as he was starting to build his business plan and, and build the mission and the strategy for trying to, you know, roll this out, I liked it enough, liked what he did, liked his efforts, liked the hard work that I obviously put some capital into it and tried to promote it. Fortunately, we just didn't get it. We had some, some positions in some stores. We never got to that national store presence that we needed to really get us going. Very, very interesting. All right. Our next question is, how has your formal and informal training shaped your journey? Well, I think my training at the collegiate level has shaped my journey a lot on the basketball court. I think that's first and foremost, me learning how to play hard every possession, never taking anything off. The commitment you have to do, you, you have to have to play basketball as you try to reach each level or the ultimate level that you feel is uh, that you can reach. Informal, I just think this trying to be a good person, have gratitude, have great people around you. I think it's important that, you know, you have coaches that are, are there for you, pushing you, and also 
you know, you're learning a lot from them as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah having gratitude is great. And I really, I mean, I, you've, you've talked about appreciation and gratitude in, in a couple of these questions and it's, it definitely, you exude that and you're, it, it's awesome. Again, I'm a little starstruck. Yeah. Too, so. <laughs> All right, Terry, our last question, what was your biggest mistake and what did you learn? My biggest mistake, that mistake or disappointment or biggest mistake. Just whatever comes to you. Well, I mean, again, for me, it's, it's always not making the 1984 Olympic teams. Mm. I was blessed to be a part of that tryouts there, and I made it all the way to the last cut, but I didn't make the team. And so that's probably the earliest disappointment or, or just opportunity that just didn't happen for me that I feel, you know, just got away from me. But I was blessed for that opportunity, but that was probably the one thing that kind of sticks out. So how did that, I mean, shape kind of like, you know, missing out on that? How did that motivate you or did it motivate you? Well, it definitely motivated me. It motivated me to do things that I felt that I wasn't able to do in the trials from a skill standpoint, to shoot the ball better, to dribble it better, to do some of those things that I feel was I was not up to par compared to some of the other guys that they kept on that team. So I, I went back my senior year that summer and just worked like crazy on those areas that I feel that really was areas that I need a lot of improvement on for when that opportunity presented itself again, those skills would be up to par and I wouldn't come up short in those areas. And I would make the team instead of not making a team. Yeah, that is a great motivator. I love how you turned that around and really worked on you know, the things that you need to work on that that's, yeah. I think that there's a lot, a lot of people out there that get disappointments and then they just kind of like throw in the towel. Like when something bad happens, it's a time to reflect and look at like what it is that you can do better and how you can make it better. And I think it's so important that as you, if you study, you have a role model, somebody you follow, every great player, every great leader, everybody who's had success have had adversity at one level or another. And you've heard the saying, it's not how you, you know, what happens when you get adversity, it's how you respond to adversity. Will you quit? Will you become more determined? Will you seek out people who you feel will help you get over the adversity and help you build the skills or not make sure that that next time you're faced with that situation, that scenario, you don't make the same shortcomings or the same mistakes. And that's that's the most important thing that when you face adver- adversity, you got to learn from those adversities for when the scenario faced you a second time, you're able to have confidence in that situation. As you emerge into that same situation, you're able to make the right decisions and make the right calls for you can be successful the second time around. Thank you so much, Terry. This has been really, really, really fun. Just love hearing your stories and I mean, having you share your experience with us, like it motivates me, you know, to Good. achieve greatness, achieving greatness with Terry Porter. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That is definitely going to be the title. Well, Terry, really appreciate <laughs> having you on. And you don't have to give anything out, but if our audience does want to contact you, do you want to give a way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah, they can check me on my email, T Porter. 8524 at gmail.com. Okay, great. We will include that. And again, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate learning about how to achieve greatness. Yeah, great. AJ, great to see you again. That was a lot yeah, of fun. To see you. Too bad we, we couldn't bring home the trophy from our tournament, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> next, thank next you year. so much, Terry. <laughs> thank you, Chris. That's right. We, Thanks, Chris. We, with you we guys. Got, We've got something to work for. <laughs> That's right. Right. We, uh, that's right. We faced adversity. Now we've got to go work on our chipping and our sand game and everything else to get ready when they come down to our house. Yeah. Yep. We got to take the trophy back. That's right. Well, I hope to see you out at the golf course sometime and let's hit the links. All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on Win, your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. 
Thank you again and enjoy your day.